Today is a treat. We have Dr. Dave Heitman with us. We just call him Dr. Dave for short. Dr. Dave. He has been uh, training both elementary school kids and elite <laughs> athletes for the last I've, it's 30, multiple multiple decades. Yeah, 30 years. Yeah, just about just around there. I'm 43 and uh, I started in sixth grade. Fourth grade was when I actually made the declaration uh, on a piece of paper that I was going to make it to the NFL. That was the start How'd of that career. Go? Uh, I played in the national championship as a starting tailback uh, of the semi-pro, which is like men's amateur league. Oh, there you uh, go. So I made it, but I was uh, one of the reasons why I got into what I got into is because I was in the emergency room six times a year. Yikes. <laughs> I wasn't, my body was not made to make it into the NFL. I just didn't have the genetics. I got it. I had well, the mindset, not the genetics. I, I have tried to get Dr. Dave to tell me about his elite athletes that uh, athletes that he has trained and conditioned, but he will not disclose names. Um, top but secret. Top, yeah. It is top no, secret. It's, but it's not top secret. I'm, but, I, I have him on the pod because he's, He's, uh, you know, a thought leader in in this space. And I, I, I candidly, we were, we were at breakfast yeah, a few weeks ago and we started telling me about all the incredibly cool technologies that are, are popping up out there oh. around healthcare, which I know is a passion of yours. Yeah. Um, I think you call it, you know, personalized relevance, which yes. is a cool, cool title, which I want to talk more about, but I said, Dr. Dave, I got to get you on the on the pod. So yeah, you know, mo more of our folks, here. more of our folks at Crowd Health and throughout the, you know, the the entire tribe of uh, people who are interested in in healthcare, people who yep. are interested in Bitcoin, can hear what I was hearing. I was just like, wow, that was that's incredible stuff. So awesome. I'm excited about talking about that. But personal personalized relevance is not a term I've heard. I've heard. Yeah. you know, quantified self. I've, you know, heard things like that, but what is personalized relevance? Yeah. So the, I mean, it's a great distinction. We are entering into, so everyone understands data. We've been in the age of data for the past 15 years, really since the internet came about mm -hmm. and people started collecting things and we didn't know what the heck we were doing with it. It was, it was just data. Mm -hmm. Everything on Google is just data, right? And the name of the game to get your brand out on Google was to simply put data in and your SEO would work. And in the health industry, it was, we just started collecting data and we have no idea what to do with it. And um, so we, we started getting all these cool tests and things of that nature. We're finally getting to that stage where things are now becoming relevant. And so we're finally getting to the technologically um, advanced stage where data is coming together and instead of looking at data, it becomes meaningful to me. And so the personalized aspect is what we used to do is just look at data from a global perspective. In other words, if I'm going to prescribe a statin, how many uh, percentage of the population is going to be affected by it? Mm -hmm. And instead of thinking of people in like categories and personalized, we think of them as just one human being mm, and yeah. we go, oh, this is going to be effective for 32% of the population. Pass, cool, we'll, we'll pass it on. The because you've heard about <clears throat> population health. Yeah, population health. That's just big data. For a long time, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just big data. So instead of looking at it this through the lens of population, we're looking at it as through the lens of you and the data yep. that we've been able to collect directly from you to help us. Yeah. And so now we're finally, finally entering into in, in AI, you know, it's been around for a really long time. Mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that happened with chat GPT is just like the icing on the cake and finally bringing it to the masses where we are going to enter this stage where it, the past 20 years have been the N ones, which is the quantified self. In other words, it's people who get really geeky about their own data, but they had to be hugely data nerds to understand what the heck anything was going on. Right. And then we had population data and we, like the masses in between, had no clue what to do, right? So mm -hmm. it was either go to your doctor and just get prescribed random things and hope for the best, or you had to get really geeky and scientific and like dig through the literature yourself to try to make meaning of things for yourself. And and AI is bringing this together for the masses that we can start to collect our own data without having to think about it. We've got enough sensors around. 
It's going to be personalized to us and it's going to be relevant to us. So now instead of just collecting healthcare data, we can collect financial data, we can collect social data, we can collect all these things around us. And that gives us a picture, a better picture of who we are, I should say for the AI to understand who we are. And then when we get presented with a health challenge or we want to lose weight or we want to go on the keto diet, like, is it right for me? Well, now we can start to answer that question. Whereas before it was just a, a crapshoot, which is why the industries, you know, the weight loss industry is so big is because it's just, you know, shotgun approach. We have no idea if it's working for someone or not. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that I struggle with a little bit is there's all of these new technologies that can collect data, whether it yeah. be, you know, a CGM or my aura ring or <laughs> there you go, CGM, or now we got, you know, the Apple yep. watch, which is starting to collect some more, more, more data. And then now that we have that, or we're, you know, more and more, it feels like day by day, we have a new technology that's being introduced. And I want to talk yeah. about some of those specifically. We're definitely going to get into that. Um, yeah. but, the, but I think that the second part of that is, is what do you do with it? Given that I still think there is a pretty significant difference of opinion, even between doctors yeah. about what some of that data means. Yep. Right. So, you know, one of the ways that we've collected data for a long, long time, decades and decades, is, you know, going into LabCorp or Quest and grabbing, <laughs> yep. you know, some blood. I just did this a couple of weeks ago and boom, we got all of this data about what's going on with our body, right? But even LDL, for example, like yeah. there is a a very different approach to LDL that yep. someone like you might have versus, you know, some of these very popular internet podcasts are like, you know, uh, Ken Berry and Peter Atia and yep. Andrew Huberman and all these guys, you read, you watch all of them and they all have a little bit of a different take on what does the data mean and yep. what we should do about it. And so do we know scientifically what <laughs> some of this data means, especially when it gets some to the, you know, the, the, the cholesterol and things like that, because I know the cholesterol yeah. is the hot topic, right? It, Everybody it wants really to talk is, about yeah. that one, especially on the internet. So in the just, internet and in the longevity space. Yeah. It's, because, because reality AI is going to be looking at the, all the docs and all the research and saying, right. this is what everybody else says. But if what the summarization of that is wrong, <laughs> yeah. we're going to get the wrong answer. Yep. Right. Because for 50 years, the summarization of those was here's a food pyramid and you should be following a pyramid, right. which has now led us to 10 percent of our population being di di has diabetes and 75 percent being obese. And so how do we how do we connect that? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, totally. And and unfortunately, like this is a career long conversation Yeah, <laughs> where if okay, we have 20 minutes. Let's yeah, do yeah, exactly. If, <laughs> if you truly understand research, if you truly understand the system, you realize that nothing is working right now, that the research itself, the foundation of what we consider the gold standard is actually incorrect. So in other words, like I just came across this yesterday. Um, someone reached out to me, they were doing a research study and they're pre-qualifying the people to try their drug or their their therapy, mm. right? And they're pre-qualifying it in a way, and I just started giggling to myself, they, they pre-qualified it in a way that they the people that they were selecting, they knew would be successful with their therapy, mm -hmm. right? And so when you look at the foundation of research, most of it is done with the intent to sell something, just straight up across the there's board. There's commercial interest somehow. Yeah, you know, there's commercial interest and or uh, uh, credibility interest. So even if you look at the most well-intended researcher out of a university, the point of them doing the research is so that they can become higher up on their job, right? And so they need to pump out research. They need to pump out successful research for their university because if we show if we did this massive research project and it showed that nothing was done and it wasn't successful, that's not going to look good for the university, right? So yeah. the whole foundation. Let's stop there for one second because I think it's really important. <laughs> yeah, there's there's something about not something. It's very clear what the human behavior is here. Yep. If you put a lot of time and effort into something, you and and many of out. these are are years or maybe even decades long. Yep. you want the outcome to be of substance, yep. right? To be interesting, um, to get notoriety or not notoriety, but to get, you know, published in journals and, and, and all these things. And so if you get to the end of a study 
and we actually find out that nothing really of substance um, statistically significant has happened, it's kind of a waste of a lot of money and a lot of time and you don't get anything for it. And so we've got this moral hazard that is we have to make something relevant out of this study, which is a massive problem. We don't celebrate the, the negative space. Yeah. We, we don't, you know, the negative space being that, oh, this doesn't work great. Now we know there's no celebration Mm -hmm. in that. And uh, so this, this is, it permeates through just for the lack of time here. Uh, it permeates through everything that we do on the foundation of the research. And then that research then gets put into medical text. And and so here's the long string that ends up happening is, uh, it, you know, we do all these different research. Some human puts all that research together, multiple research projects, mm-hmm. and they go, oh, I'm going to write a book about this. And then that becomes a medical text. That medical text then trains the doctor. That doctor then goes into a long residency. In that residency program, they're learning from people who are 20 years into the profession who also got trained on this this human-constructed research thing. And so all in all, when you talk to people who are in the know of of being an expert around um, how up-to-date are we on our medical procedures and things like that, on average, they'll say somewhere in between the the 17-year range to 25-year range that people are, the, the medical system is behind wow. on what the research is saying now, but everyone's trained on all the old stuff. And then now you start to go complicated of, we live in a world where it's, I can't even remember the stat now, but it's something like 4,000 research articles are published every day. Wow. Uh, and it's just impossible for a human brain to even keep up. No matter the most well, uh, well-intended doctor, it is impossible for them to validate research that they're reading, validate the sources that they're getting their information from. And so we live in these cycles where all this information gets construed and then it's the telephone game, right? We've all played telephone as a kid when we Mm -hmm. stood around in a circle and we tried to tell. And by the end, that person gets like a completely different answer. And so this is where we are at. Um, The only truth that we really know is that as a society, we're getting sicker. And we know that nothing is working. <laughs> yeah. So this is where I'm hopeful that technology will come in. This is this is the savior. This is the age of relevance that AI and 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 I love having this conversation. I was just on a podcast yesterday about this. Uh, AI will help unhinge all of these human brain biases that we have. AIs will start to culminate other AIs, and those AIs will look for biases in the construct of things. And then, therefore, AIs will start to solve other AIs' problems, and then they'll be able to give us the whittled-down information that the human brain can understand. Yeah, Uh, And that's what I'm hopeful for in the future of this AI revolution coming through, that everything that we think we know right now, uh, and, and we can see this across to every generation, every decade, we used to think, Low fat was good. Now high fat. Yeah. Right. Barefoot running versus high stability shoes. Like what is actually good for us? About every 10 to 12 years, we completely change mantras because of marketing, um, which is a whole nother conversation of, you know, you put a trillion dollars into marketing something, uh, people are going to believe it. Yeah. (laughs) It doesn't matter what the actual science says. If we want, if Nike wants us to go barefoot running from 2004 to 2009, they made it happen. And then hookahs hit the scene of hyper stability of their shoes. And so then hookah took over and, oh, now everyone's wearing super cushioned shoes, right? Right. Like this is just the game in the society that we live in. And we have to have the perspective that when we hear information, and it doesn't matter how credible the sources of Huberman or Natia and, and those sources, we have to ask ourselves where are they getting their information right. from and how much do we need to believe that versus... How much is this actually relevant to me? Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things when you hear this all the time. If if you have a set of data, you can pretty much have it say anything you want yeah. by cherry picking. Yeah. Right. And so at some point, you know, there's got to be a standard, I feel like, where, hey, you've got to provide all the information and then yep. you have to allow an AI bot or whatever to go through that yep. and draw its own conclusions. Yep. So these these scientists or experimenters or whatever saying, hey, 
you go and grab the data, you stick yep. it into a, an unbiased bot and let it tell you what the, the summary is. That's actually is. where I'm in favor of regulation. Right. You know, if, 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 we hey, can hey, hey, easy, it, easy on this. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. the, well, regulation can be good. I know. And, I'm, and, I'm just kidding with yeah, you. Yeah. No, like think if we had a scientific standard. Think if we had a scientific standard that an AI uh, combed through all of the research proposals first before the research was done. And it gave a, a rubrics cube of like, how valid is this thought process? Like where are the potential um, uh, you know, conflicts of interest, you know, all mm -hmm. of that kind of fun stuff. Like that would be really powerful to, to go through now. Who would be responsible for creating it? You know, I don't know. Like, because somebody's got to be responsible for creating the algorithms in the AI. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. it, it learns upon itself. That's the whole point of artificial intelligence. Right. But somebody's building the the initial AI. And it, there's some funny Chat GPT examples that <laughs> yes. were that we're seeing where, you know, depending upon where you are on the political landscape, Chat GPT is going to give you very different yep. different answers. Um, you know, I, I think there was one where I saw, you know, like have Donald Trump do a poem about how beautiful America is. And it says, I do not get into politics. And then it yeah. says, have Joe Biden write a poem, you know, from the perspective of Joe Biden, how amazing, you know, the, the U.S. is. And it goes into this beautiful, long poem yep. of how beautiful the And it's like, clearly there was some bias there in terms of, yes. of how that was created. And, and I think those will all get worked out. Like we're still in such the infant stage of all of sure. this. And people are, are, because it's so popular so fast, people are getting really flared up. And unfortunately, like, we're all just really slow at this. Uh, by the time the news started talking about that particular instance, there's already plugins that solve mm -hmm. that problem, right? Okay. Like, it's, and, and so the exponential growth, and, and my friends hate me for saying this, it's an exponential of an exponential. Don't you understand? <laughs> right? Like, I, I look like the crazy conspiracy person of like, it's impossible for you to even understand. And, and I think that's where we're going is we can't even fathom six months from now uh, what it's going to look like because these AIs are going to start developing their own AIs. Yeah, that's um, incredible. Yeah. It really is. Well, let's, let's talk about some of these. You know, one of the reasons during our conversation at, at breakfast the other day that I wanted to have you on was, you know, you're giving yes. me some examples. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the headline of a recent blog that you wrote was something to the effect, um, you know, to, of your bathroom is going to replace your primary care physician, yes. which I'm sure all the primary care docs are going to love that. And maybe yes. we should make the, I, the I title little, of this pod. I have a little asterisk at the bottom of the uh, blog. <laughs> I say, don't worry, primary care friends. I, I feel you on this. That Your job is actually going to get better. <laughs> yeah. Well, good? let's walk through some of the tech that you yeah. see that's either here, which I think some of it's actually here. All, almost all of it's here. Okay. That's the crazy thing about it. And this. then anything coming down the, the pipe that you say like, hey, these are the things that could, you know, change the way that we interact with 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 medicine. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically of the one where I'm, you know, peeing in my toilet and it's yes. telling me, you know, <laughs> some of my my vital statistics, right? So yep. that one was pretty interesting to me. Yep. Uh, so one of the big fears, so I'll start off, well, I'll, I'll even step back even further. So yes, I, I truly believe that, uh, all primary care will be done through our bathroom in the near future. Uh, and I mean actual near future. Most of these devices already exist that we're going to talk about today. Uh, most of them are already getting to an accuracy level that that is unmatched. Um, and when you have real-time data, if we step back and we look at the power of data, the more long-term, longitudinal it would be called, uh, the more long-term that we get that, and the more consistent we get data points, the more usable that data becomes. So in other words, when you go to get your blood draw, and it's once a year, and most people do once every 10 years, but uh, even at once a year, that is such a tiny snapshot of what is actually going on in your body. You could have had a hard workout that day, and it could have totally like changed the biomarkers, yeah. right? So it almost becomes a meaningless blood draw. Same thing with blood pressure and all of these aspects if we can get them on a longer term uh, timeline, mm -hmm. it becomes way more accurate and way more useful. And so that's what I think that the bathroom has to offer for us is it is a sacred place that we all have to spend time in. You can't get away from your bed and you can't get away from your bathroom. So I think <laughs> that these two things are going to be just completely filled with sensors and we already have these sensors available. So 
uh, this past year. Uh, a really cool company got released uh, into the public that measures your urine as you're peeing into the toilet. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon there's going to be stool samplers as well that it'll just go through grind and measure all the DNA uh, and RNA and all of wow. the, the things that come out of you. And it's going to give you that timeline that every time you go to the bathroom, and it's not that that one little spot matters. Like I said, it's the long term, like, your glucose level started up here and now it's down here, right? Your cholesterol started at here and now it's here. Your thyroid level started at here and now it's here. The problem with most medical testing in today's society is one is we set these standards way back in the days when we did the research of what we thought a normal population right. was. We set these normal range and then that's just classified as disease or not disease and no in between. And so a person can very well start at one end of the range of thyroid, be at the other end of the range of thyroid, uh, either going either way, and you can have massive health problems, but according to a medical test, you're still within normal range. Yeah, interesting. And so what will happen is, is when we can collect data for long term, we'll be able to see that change, match it with what the symptoms are, because we'll be able to easily monitor people's symptoms because people will, can just talk into a device now and all of those sorts of things. And we'll be able to match it with other tests at the same time to be like, oh, okay, your thyroid's going this way. Things happening in your urine are going this way. Oh, and by the way, we see a mole forming on your skin. Okay, it's time to come in and this, this, and this needs to be adjusted for you. Yeah, I'm thinking about the blood test because I've done a few blood tests. I try to get them at least twice a year. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, they're delivered to me in a PDF format, <laughs> yep. right? Which is impossible to scrape that data it's off there data. and yep. and and put it into any kind of Excel spreadsheet. I mean, I guess yep. I could, but it takes takes a well, while. There, there's lots of programs for this. Okay. The the beauty of this, there there's companies uh, like Heads Up Health, I'm not affiliated with it or anything like that, but there's companies out there where you can upload all your stuff to. Okay. And you can connect in devices and you can start to get longitudinal snapshots essentially of your health. But I'm just thinking of like, I, I went to LabCorp, for example, and LabCorp gave me a PDF file, yeah. right? And so how do I take that PDF file and get it into a program? Because I'm assuming I got to go and I got to punch in all the numbers, right? And, and then that panel that I, I get eight or 10, you know, different Yep. Test from lipids to thyroid to blood sugars to, you know, all those things. I, yep. I'm assuming I just got to punch those things all in. Punch or, it or scan or it. Scan. There, there's, you know, readers now that can okay. read some of that type yeah. of stuff. Um, but it's a pain in the ass and this it's a is pain a in problem. The ass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why we're, that's why we're still, especially in the healthcare field, they're stuck in the age of data. They, you know, like they just can't get their minds out of the data. They're not trying to make it relevant to people. Like, uh, even doctors have a hard time understanding other lab tests, right? And yeah. so uh, it's it's just one of those things where uh, we need technology to come in to start to solve those issues because there's no good way to do it until we have technology that makes it relevant and connected to all the other data points yeah. that we're doing. So we got this urine, we've got stool, yeah. we've got, which which so makes imagine, total sense. Imagine like, what, what, would I, what would I figure, what would I be able to tell by my urine? Like what? Are, what are the things that are collected in urine samples Tons that help of different me? Different chemicals. Okay. Yeah. So, like, imagine. So, your kidney is just a big filter system, right? And so, all the different they're called metabolites, which are the through the process of creating things in our body, we give off other chemicals, mm -hmm. and so we can monitor where those things are at. So, the basic example one is uh, very simple that we're all used to seeing is. Do you have protein in your urine? Right. Right. Like those are the big ones that people understand, but there's a lot more chemicals in urine that we've just never tracked before because we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also another point of the, all of this. There's there's lots of stuff that we can track in the human body, but we have no idea what they do. Mm. <laughs> like, oh, it's great. We can measure this. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in the future, we'll be able to actually make meaning of that. So that's where there's there's like dozens of chemicals in your urine dozens of chemicals in your stool, uh, and then adding in to, especially with the stool, uh, or cotton swab, or you have maybe an infection on your skin, uh, just taking a cotton swab, and there'll be a little thing on your counter that you put that cotton swab into, and it's going to measure the genome of everything that you just scraped off your body. And so it's going to be able to delineate between your genome 
in yeast genome and bacteria genome hmm. and fungus genome. And it's going to be able to give you the full scale of, do you have an infection or not? What kind of infection is it? We won't need to grow things on Petri dishes anymore. So you won't have to have, sure. you know, a two to three day wait period. We'll be able to instantly tell from the genetic material around. Uh, and then this also gets into in the, the near future is going to be epigenetic, and this is going to be a fun conversation to get into, epigenetic monitors. Mm -hmm. So what is our body producing in real time? What proteins are being produced? If I work out, right, so the whole point of working out is to destroy our muscles to build it up bigger. We need a lot of enzymes. We need a lot of things to happen in our body for that to happen. And we'll be able to stick a simple like Band-Aid on our skin as a skin sensor, and we'll be able to monitor the levels of those different hmm. chemicals being produced in our body. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and then one of the other ones that you were talking about, which I thought was fascinating, was uh, you're looking into the mirror. Yeah. And that mirror will be scanning your body to say, okay, that's a new mole. That mole's yep. grown. You get that to one's dance changed in front of colors. The All your dreams are going to come true. You're yeah. Gonna, you're going to be able to have your TikTok videos. No, I'm just exactly. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it, it, it does. I mean, that's a super cool thing because I know that, you know, many, many people, yes. you know, have, uh, I have a family member who gets these, I think they're basal cell carcinomas. Yep. Um, you know, it's got to go in every six months or whatever to, to check them out. And it's, yep. you know, a, a dermatologist sitting there and looking at them and looking at pictures that they took before. And I'm like, how can this even be, you know, effective? But right. if you have AI that will look at this and say, okay, You've I've got, seen this yep, one before. Exactly. And it's it growing. every yeah. single little I mean, blemish on your skin. And I mean, it does bring up some privacy issues. Yeah. So right? like, I'm not sure we'll I want to like dance because, around in front of the, yep. the, the, uh, the mirror, you know, <laughs> the next generation like, of cybersecurity is that you're all going to get your own little cloud essentially is the easiest way to describe it. Yeah. And our data is all going to get into our own personalized cloud that will de-identify anything so that if you do have to contact and have that data go outsourced to something, mm -hmm. it will happen for you in a de-identified way that they can go back and all of your data will be secure for you. So all the privacy, all that stuff's getting solved. It's, it's gotta, On a it's massive gotta get scale, solved. It's getting solved. For any of this to work, that's yep. gotta be, that's yep. gotta be solved. And it needs to be seamless and integrated. And like the, the true thing that I'm excited for is for you to not have to think about your health. Like yeah. you shouldn't have to think about connecting devices. You shouldn't have to be thinking about, oh, is this, do I need to do this? And do I need to connect this device? Like just connecting this gl continuous glucose monitor. And then there's three different apps that I can download for it. Like all that stuff goes away and it becomes seamless. That, yeah. That's where I want the world to go. Yeah. No, um, I love that. And this AI mirror, you know, like you get out of the shower and you just spin around and it has the cameras that it can, uh, uh, capture every single blemish on your skin and start to track it for you. Uh, it can track your infections. Um, imagine having a surgery and all you have to do is go stand in front of the mirror and it automatically starts to detect if it can see pus, if it can see if it's healing properly, mm -hmm. like all of those things. Like this is a big industry that can be very helpful for people. Uh, and it's just as simple as in integrating it into the mirror, into the bathroom. What else bathroom related? I want to talk about some wearables and things like that, but anything else in the bathroom that we talk about yeah, to replace so our primary care doc? <laughs> all, all of the body weight scale stuff. Yeah, so sure. measuring your hydration levels, your, your not just how much you weigh, that that's actually almost inconsequential when you understand data. It's the body fat percentage. It's where are you holding your body mm -hmm. fat? Uh, and this is where AI can become extremely helpful is we know certain things like fat uh, on the belly versus not on the belly. Uh, you know, the, the amount of fat in between your legs. Uh, there's real problems that women who don't get fat in between their legs, like they have a bigger, yeah. um, uh, um, you know, thigh area or less of a thigh area, I guess that would be. They're actually at increased risk of, Interesting. Uh, you know, certain heart attacks. Right. And so. AI is going to be starting to figure this stuff out at a higher rate for us to understand it deeper. But the scale in combination with the mirror, the mirror will be able to take that 3D image of you, know where the body fat is actually getting put on. The scale will measure the percentage, your lean muscle mass, your water weight, all of those sorts of things. And it'll give you a really good clear picture of where you are metabolically. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff is, is cool. I would buy it today probably if I could. Yeah. Um, but I guess the question is how far away are we from these things being 
economical for you know uh, a, a middle class person to have in their in yep. their bathroom? I right, think we're right around the corner. Okay. The the manufacturing has gotten better on the chip side, and this is what needed to happen. The last five years, we've had major advancements in chip technology, so much so, and like um, people kind of hate me for this thought process, but like, you know, a watch company right now, like the Garmin's, the Whoops, those sorts mm -hmm. of things, they're going to be democratized very soon. Like it's only going to be fifty cents to make these sensors soon, mm. and so there's going to be they're going to be sewn into our fabrics. They're going to be basically like band aids you stick on yourself, and that's literally right around the corner. And so the democratization of the, um, you know, the foundation of the building of the chips and and getting that technology out is already here. It just needs to be this next layer of AI added, and then suddenly it becomes easy to hit it to the mass population. Sure. So five to ten years, we're going to be rocking and rolling with a lot of this stuff where, you know, toilets will start just becoming equipped with it or just a super, uh, super easy sensor that you put into it. Yeah. Interesting. I, I was in, I had a breakfast this morning. Oh. <laughs> interestingly enough, um, with the general counsel of one of these um, wearable. Yeah. companies um and what he was saying is that one of the, the biggest barrier to mass adoption of some of these things is probably going to be the fda mm, yep. and and so especially as you get wearables that are class two kind of prescription types of of things i believe the cgm is a class two prescription yep. fda regulated device yep um, and it is very difficult. It takes a lot of money to get yep. one of these things on the market, you know, and from my perspective, you're wearing a CGM, my new, you know, level CGM is in the mail. It should be here tomorrow. <laughs> nice. I'm hoping, um, <laughs> you know, the, I'm not diabetic. You're not diabetic. Yep. We're not using this for a medical illness or yep. issue. And therefore, from my perspective, and I'd love pushback if you have any, is the FDA shouldn't be regulating a non-medical illness related device. Yep. You know, like we these CGMs, I think what you're wearing on your your arm right now is probably life saving. A, 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 but a yeah. few bucks worth of right. stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and I know that levels, for example, is a couple hundred dollars a month. Like it's not inexpensive. Right. You know, and so it's like, how do we democratize, yep. you know, some of these devices so that we can all have them? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure the the mirror will be the FDA will want to get into the mirror and the FDA will want to get into the stool sample and the FDA, yep. you know. How, so here's here's yeah. the I love this topic because this is as a person who has startups and I've I've dealt with the investor questions of how are you going to help? You know, like, how are you going to get this through the FDA? Right. Because I'm creating some AI, uh, digital empathy, AI stuff. Um, to me, what I see is the big thing happening is a vast majority of this, there's going to be a clear delineation. Right now, we have way too many people getting involved in these companies that are doctors. And it's good to have them, but what they end up this doing is- This is a doctor is, saying this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, they're pushing it into the you're FDA. You're going to get or whatever the equivalent is for doctors. <laughs> yeah. De-certified, de yeah. whatever it is. The, the pandemic uh, really um, Didn't shed help light a lot of the, Yeah, <laughs> shed light onto a lot of this. Um, it's it's one of those things where, uh, again, it's, it's old information getting put into the startups. So when we try to get cleared to be a class two medical device, that means that we're trying to diagnose something. Mm. If we stay away from a lot of that, I think, to me, the masses is going to shift away from being doctor controlled to people controlled, just like Bitcoin, right? There, we're going to take this big shift in healthcare, where a vast majority of it is going to be considered lifestyle, and that is not sure. FDA needed to be you know, monitoring until the action needs to happen that a medical intervention needs to happen. And this is why I say that primary cares are going to love this thought process that the bathroom is going to take over their job because a vast majority of what enters the medical system doesn't need to be in the medical system. We could take the strain off of our whole system because there's only enough medical doctors for 1% of the population 1% of the time to see a medical doctor. Mm. The rest of all of this should come from continuous glucose monitors and urinalysis and you know, continuous blood draws once a quarter kind of yeah. thing. 
And all of that data should just go into that individual's little cloud so that they can monitor that when something does go wrong, an alert system happens or lifestyle intervention first that is not medically necessary of like, okay, you're starting to get a little dehydrated, get some water, right? Yeah. Um, that I think that a vast majority of these products and these companies will start to shift their focus away from trying to fit into the healthcare trillion dollar industry. Because right now with the startup industry, and you're very familiar with this, mm -hmm. is that they're trying to get their big exit. They're trying to get their big IPO. And in order to do that, you got to try to sell to the medical community. You got to sell to those big insurance companies. You got to sell to the big healthcare companies. And I think that the future is going to direct to consumer. The direct to consumer Amen. market is going to be much, much larger than the healthcare industry itself. Uh, you know, and it, it is right now. If we, if we're being honest with ourselves, right? If you look at Nike, if you look at the weight loss industry, right? These are all like an estimated fourteen trillion dollar industry. Wow. Uh, that is a much bigger piece of the pie if these companies stop trying to go into the healthcare system yeah. and they go into the direct-to-consumer market. Now, obviously, you can form strategic partnerships and things like that to still get the big contracts, but I think that there's going to be this shift that happens, and then the doctors are going to take their stress off. They're going to be able to work with real serious problems, and, and in most part, you know, give it 20, 30, 40, 50 years of this, and there's going to be a whole psychological shift in the human population towards preventative medicine mm -hmm. instead of sick and disease medicine. Um, so that's what I'm excited for the most. That's why I call it the age of relevance. If we can make it relevant to the everyday yes. person, they become in power of their own health instead of saying, oh, the only way I can get healthy is to go to the doctor. No, they're going to say the only way I can get healthy is to take care of myself. Yeah, amen. I mean, the, the, that's what we call the podcast Sovereign Health. I mean, yeah. in reality, we need to be self-sovereign yeah. over our own health care. Yeah. This is not something we should be outsourcing to health insurance companies right. or the yeah. government or in many cases, not even the doctor. Because yeah. as we are seeing with some of these, these devices, we can start measuring these things ourselves. We yep. can start learning what they mean. Um, you know, ever since I started the CGM, I understand now what my my fasting glucose levels should be, where they're at. Yep. And I don't need a doctor to say, hey, you know, your fasting glucose needs to be, you know, under 100 or under 90 or whatever, right. you know, whatever it is for, for that individual. And I also don't need a doctor because the doctor probably doesn't know a whole lot of times is like, how do you actually lower that glucose over a right. sustainable period of time? And so that's why we need, you know, we can start being sovereign over our, our own health care as opposed yeah. to being, you know, so reliant upon doctors, no offense to doctors out there who are yeah, listening, but it's like, they're doing they, what you, they're they trained don't want to, to be do. nannies to, yeah. you know, people, ah, you, you know, for, for something, is there some stat where, I don't know, 75% or something like that, or ER visits are for oh, nothing, Yep. you know, and, you know, even, we, had, even if you look at COPD, one of the biggest costs in healthcare is yeah. COPD. Sure. And Const it's something const constructive, constructive. Can, what is it? Constructive object oh, pulmonary, pulmonary disease. Disorder. Yeah. Uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. Obstructive yeah. pulmonary disease. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. So chronic. It's things like, it's things like, like asthma. What does COPD stand for? Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's things like asthma. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so this is like one of the Emphysema, biggest. Emphysema, asthma, things like that. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's one of the biggest costs of healthcare is emergency room visits for uncontrolled breathing. Mm. And so. I became acutely aware of this. So when I graduated chiropractic school, uh, I was getting a master's degree in sports science as well. Uh, and then I was doing rotations at the University of Wisconsin uh, in their medical system. And I was the, the first person, first chiropractor allowed in, really kind of a fun story. Uh, but I was doing cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab. I was working with the top docs in the world around like getting a heart transplant, lung transplant, and then rehabbing them. Mm -hmm. And there's so many simple steps that you can do to just teach someone how to breathe, but insurance won't pay that. They mm -hmm. would rather pay for the emergency room bill. And so it's estimated something like 50 to 60% of emergency room visits would be controlled and not have happen by a simple 20 minute exercise instruction with that patient to learn how to calm them down wow. and breathe properly. Wow. Like it is that simple, but the the world is so wrapped up into the medical, like we got to treat something 
rather than just give the tools to the patient. <laughs> right. Uh, and I saw it firsthand. Yeah. Right? And so that's, yeah, I, I could digress into a lot of things well, we, around we that. See, but, yeah. We see, um, I, I, I hate to digress to these ER visits, but it's one of those things where, you know, at Crowd Health, we see all of these bills that people are are generating, and the number of bills that I see for people going to the ER for bruises and yes. little cuts, like you know, ten stitches or something like this, yeah. is not like cutting off your finger. This is like ten right. stitches and things like that. I'm just like, wow. Like we're gonna have a pod with a an ER doc who's gonna say, okay, when do we need to think about going to the ER versus going to urgent care? Well, because I mean, these spring these these urgent yeah. cares are springing up all over the place, and the vast majority, unless there is potential death, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to an urgent care. One because they're way cheaper, but two is I don't have to sit in an emergency room with a bunch of or, or they call them EDs now, an emergency department with you know a bunch of sick people yeah. for hours upon hours upon hours, like which is hell yep. from my perspective yes so Here's anyway a fun i digress conversation around that it's it's not digressing i think this this really plays a part into empowering people because when people are empowered they can make better decisions and and one of the things that i saw so madison wisconsin is hmo regulated health maintenance organization yeah uh wisconsin no, is one of the most high cost places on the planet exactly to, to and what they don't care. talk about is that there's an extremely long waiting period to get in so like when I was practicing there, I had my practice there for 10 years as a sports medicine physician. I was I, I had a huge sports medicine facility. I was working with all the athletes there. And it would be like for someone to get physical therapy in that sometimes would be a three-month wait. Wow. And it was like, okay, that person just sprained their ankle or they tore their ACL and it's like three months wait to get into the physical therapy. No. I mean, come on. And so what ends up happening is a whole bunch of people use the ER system as their primary care doctor. They don't they don't make any appointments with their primary care doctor because it's so pointless. Just when something goes wrong, they the only option they had was to go to the emergency room. And so like it frequently and like I hate to say this as the doctor helping people, but I would make them go to the emergency room with something that I know could have been, you know, set this up with your primary care, go get an MRI of this disc. Mm -hmm. Instead of having them go through that process and then that doctor like second guessing me and like all this crazy stuff, I'd just send them to the emergency right. room because it was the only way to get the care for them. Uh, and it's just like, it was a huge fault in that system. Yeah. Uh, and no one talks about it. No one, no one has that realization that the, the healthcare costs are, are so extremely high because there's just no options for mm -hmm. people. There's not enough doctors. And and then you only have three doctors to go to on an HMO plan. You don't get the option, right? right. <laughs> so Yeah. I mean, shameless plug for Crowd Health here. You know, one of the things that we thought was really important when we started the company was having giving people access to primary yep. care. And now this is virtual primary care, which, you know, there are some limitations there, but the vast majority of things I can talk to a doctor, yep. uh, primary care doc, and within minutes, oftentimes, and, you know, have a full conversation with my doc without, you know, leaving my office or my yep. couch or whatever, which I think is awesome. You know, the other thing we are doing is, is virtual urgent care, which, yep. you know, just... A couple of months ago, my four-year-old, um, who is a little monkey, um, fell off <laughs> of her bed, smacked her head on the ground. No more monkeys. No more monkeys jumping on the bed. And that's one of her favorite, you know, books. Um, you know, smacks her 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 head on the ground, and yeah. so we're like, and starts, you know, speaking gibberish. Mm, and yep. so I'm like, okay, we're going to you know the ER because you know I'm I'm afraid of cranial damage or whatever yep. you know um you know of course like the worst outcome yeah, always becomes, yeah you know so i'm parents I'm, nightmares i think uh, yeah. like oh this is cancer this is brain bleeds this is exactly <laughs> yep. um you know you hear all these crazy stories of people falling while they're skiing and they have brain bleeds and they're yep. dead or they're in comas or whatever um and so i just pulled up my ur my phone got on urgent care talked to a doc and the doc was like here's uh, three or four things you should be looking for. Is she vomiting? Is she sleepy? Is she da 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 and da da, yep. da. Watch her for 30 minutes. And, the, you know, if you see any of these things, go to the ER. If you don't, you're probably fine. She probably has a small, slight concussion. Yep. Um, and, man, I was like, we just saved, and you know, and everything is fine. We saved probably four to six hours in the ER, yep. you know, maybe more, 
right? Because you knew they were going to do every scan in the book on yep. her to make sure, which would have been tens of thousands of dollars more than likely. And all saved because I had a five minute virtual care visit with somebody on your telephone. Right. Mike, why are we not doing more of this? Yes. You know, like let's jump on that. There should be that. call centers everywhere. For yeah, it. exactly. Let's everybody, before you go to the ER, unless it's like, feels like you're about to die. Right. Yep. Like let's jump on and talk to a doc real quick to make sure that this is something we should actually go to the ER on. Yep. So I think um, the last time I looked at stats, it was something around the range of, and this has been a long time since I've looked at this, so I don't have no idea if it's legitimate now, but it was 96% of what entered into uh, the hospital system through the ER or urgent care. Uh, 96 actually percent didn't actually need to be there. It's so only 4% oh, that wow. actually needed. So my number, my, seven, my 75% was probably low then. I mean, yeah. that's crazy. And, and, you know, you go to urgent care, it is one tenth the price of right. going to an ER at a hospital. Yep. And you virtual know. visits should be even a tenth And of virtual that visits yeah. within our platform is, you know, free. It's a part of, it part of, you yeah. know, being a member of, of crowd health. Um, you know, so we talked about some of these tools, which I, I, I <laughs> yeah. love. What, what, what are your favorites? I mean, if, if somebody's listening to this podcast and saying, okay, you guys have talked about a lot, um, you know, lots of tools out there, lots yes. to come, you know, what are maybe like the, the two or three things that somebody making, you know, $80,000 or something can get um, that you think would be helpful for them to start understanding their health, to start being sovereign yeah. in the way that they look at their health. What are the two or two or three that you oh, think are, are most a beautiful interesting? Question, because this is this is what drives me. And so we don't need any money. We we need habits. And okay. so uh, all of health comes down to like an awareness of what we're doing. And so one of the simplest ways that I've helped people is to simply track what we're doing on paper and pen you know like what, what is that paper and paper pen, and it's pen? This what? crazy technology <laughs> super advanced um because we know that the number one thing that makes us healthier whether it's weight loss or we're trying to get into shape or we're monitoring cancer where you know it doesn't matter what it is is to simply track like two to three things that are keystone habits so in other words, a keystone habit would be how much water we're drinking, mm. how many minutes of sun, how many minutes of walking. Uh, and especially like if we are doing something like going to the gym, it's statistically irrelevant what they're actually doing in the gym. It's if you make it to the gym or not <laughs> on the long-term outcome and if you get healthy. And this is crazy because, you know, marketing will sell you on every sorts of program about gyms and blah, blah, blah programs. Right. But we know what in reality, what happens is if you make it to the gym and you start doing five to 10 minutes and, and there's no organization to it whatsoever, you just go do random machines or random treadmill and you go home, you just keep track on paper and make it consistent four to five times a week where you're trying to do something. Sure. Every day you're trying to get those eight glasses of water and it, it doesn't mm -hmm. even matter if that's the right amount for you or not. Like there's all sorts of People overcomplicate this stuff. Consistency is the number one thing that everyone can start doing. That consistency will reshape your brain to be interested in taking care of your health. Mm. Then it starts to get exciting. And so I look at things in three-month and six-month segments. This is human nature uh, backed by science of epigenetic change. So epi epigenetic changes where we're born with our parents' DNA but then stuff happens to us. Environmental happens to us. There's so there's DNA. There's there's also par parental epigenetics, and then there's environmental epigenetics. Environmental epigenetics are like if we sit on the couch for 20 years, we're gonna get fat, right? Right. This is the chemistry changing in our body to say I need to store more energy, and I'm going to put energy into making fat. All those little chemicals that make that happen is what the epigenetic expression is. So three months, six months, we just need to do stuff for three months segments in order to make that chemical change in our body. So if all we did for three months was drink a couple of extra glasses of water a day and just make it to the gym or make it to that 20 minute walk for three months straight, we are going to make a massive landslide change in our body. Mm -hmm. And our body is going to get addicted to that new norm where our mind will finally catch up and be like, What's the next thing for me? 
And so that's the starting point across the board for everyone is just simple pen and paper on a calendar, on the wall, like whatever you work best with. If you have a journal, if you don't, sticky notes on your <laughs> your monitor, yeah. whatever yeah. the case may be, just keeping track of that consistency. Once you have that down, then you can add a layer of it to of like certain apps. They're ubiquitous. There are so many of them that you can download. You just have to find a tribe that you resonate well with. Mm-hmm. And this is knowing a little bit about yourself on like, are you a competitive person? Are you a social person? If you're a social person, you want to get on the apps that are going to promote social of like, oh, let's do this group walk or let's go do the the group bowling exercise, you know, whatever the case may be. If you're competitive, that's maybe where you start to get into the tracking your time, tracking your right. distance, all of that kind of stuff. And then you can buy your watch. Then you can buy, you know, the the more advanced apps. Uh, but knowing that, that's the second layer is just apps are everywhere. Watches are everywhere. Yep. You can get these baseline Apple Health, not the best from a data standpoint, but who cares? Again, it's getting after that consistency uh-huh. and developing things. Then you get to the stage where you and I are at. That's where right now in today's society, because it is still a little bit complicated to put all these different devices on ourselves uh, and make meaning of the data but we can. So like I have a more advanced Garmin watch. I have the continuous glucose monitor. I monitor my blood work. I get different, you know, calcium How often scores. do you do blood work? Uh, it, right. Currently I'm doing it every quarter okay. um, because I had some pancreas issues and <laughs> different things like that. Okay. Uh, but it was like, it was once a year simply because uh, at the age and what I was doing, I was still making progress with my health irregardless of a blood draw. And it wasn't until something started going wrong that I started increasing the frequency of it. Yeah. Um, when things aren't going wrong, it's the blood work itself is almost meaningless. I would much rather have my data from my Garmin telling me how well am I sleeping. Right. Like the basic stuff. That's way more valuable when nothing's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. That's, so that's... CG, CGM is is an interesting one for that stage two. Yes. They are expensive. Yeah. Well, that's why it's stage three. Oh, that's stage three. Yeah. Stage three would be okay. like you've already done six months of taking care of yourself. Sure. So step one, paper and pen, keep track of habits. Step two is just get involved with watches and apps. Okay. Step three is add in the, the gadgets and the gizmos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I am a huge CGM fan. Yeah. You, you're wearing one, so yeah. you you do. They're expensive. Mine yeah. is levels. I think it's two hundred bucks a month. Well, this it's, one. So this is the great conversation about crowd health. Is uh, I do direct to primary care, uh-huh. so that I don't have to deal with physicians who don't understand anything, and I right. can go out and I select my physician that I want to work with. And basically, you know, I, because I've been doing this all for twenty years, I just have great conversations with her and sit down and be like, yeah, this month I think I'm going to do a continuous glucose monitor. Okay. It was 80 bucks for a month's supply. Really? Right? Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So who are you, is that is that the Freestyle, the Libre or whatever yeah, it is? Yeah, this is the Freestyle Libre 2. Okay. Yep. And so that's the one where you kind of do the little yep, tap? Yeah, they're, they're all, so there's only two continuous glucose monitors. So Levels contracts out both of those. Dexcom. The Dexcom and, and the Libre. The, yeah, yep. Libre. Okay. Because uh, those are the only one, you know, they, you have to be a really big company to create this tech, right? Sure. <laughs> to make it worth it. So Levels. Unfortunately. Yeah. Levels uh, contracts out with them that when you buy the Levels package, you, you get to choose which one of those that you're doing. And then they have a more advanced app. Uh, And that's where the power of levels comes in. And that's what you're paying for is that premium. They spent a lot of money on development (laughs) pre-AI to try to make meaning uh, into that. And their app is at a whole nother level compared to like what just the regular app is. Yeah, it's clearly that the Freestyle Libre and the Dexcom apps were not made for direct to consumer. Yeah. You know, consumption. You can just type in your. It's it's pretty brutal in terms of the. But the Levels one is really great. But it's really expensive. You know, one of the things I've done with Levels is I have gone through that. And, you know, 200 bucks a month is, you know, not cheap. So I did it for, I think, four or five months. You start understanding what you're eating yes. and how it impacts your, you your blood sugars yep. as an individual. 
Um, I went off it for a couple of months. I found that behaviorally it was much easier for me to eat things that I shouldn't be eating <laughs> yep. so that I went back on it. Um, <laughs> and I saw my weight go directly kind of aligned with whether yeah. I'm, you know, so it was that it's an little, accountability partner. It was an accountability partner. And that's really, and I, now I'm doing it every other month. So it's $200 every other month. So let's say it's a hundred dollars a month, it, you know, on yep. average, um, which is, you know, less than I pay for my cell phone and things like that. So for me, it's a valuable tool. Um, you know, the other one that I use is the aura ring, yep. um, for primarily for sleep. Yep. Um, I don't really find it useful for a whole lot of other things other they're than they're making massive improvements for the activity okay. side of it. Yeah. Great. So I think in the next year, they're going to start to become top notch in that way as well. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, like lots of people that get into that third stage of, of really putting all this together, the aura ring is what they rely on for their sleep. And then the garments and things like that, they'll rely on for their activity. Yeah. Yep. And then the other thing that I use is um, a ketone meter. Yep. Um, so what are ketones? Yeah. <laughs> ketones are an energy source, uh, mostly used by the brain. Uh, but it is also a byproduct of like when you do the ketogenic diet, that that word comes from you're going into ketosis which means that you start making your own ketones at an exaggerated level. And it uh, is one of the few things that crosses into your lungs. And so this is why you can breathe and measure your ketones. Yep. Um, so, yeah. That's so, the basics that, you know, ketones for, for me means that I, I try to keep in ketosis, which I yep. think is what, above one or something like that on the ketone meter? Or is it or 0.8 or something like that? Yeah, I think 0.8 is, is more. It, it, it really, so this is where. It, it varies yeah. from individual, I think. It varies from individual. Because we all have ketones, I believe, in our blood, don't we? Correct. Yeah, yeah we all have ketones, so it's just, a, it's, yep. a, it's just a level. I'm usually, you know, 1.52 or even above that. Um, and the, the reason I, I check it is because I like staying in, in ketosis. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, um, my kids like pizza on Friday nights. Ah, right. Right. And so I eat pretty much keto the entire week, except Friday nights where I want to have pizza with my kids. Yeah. Um, you know, which I think is an, kind of an important part of the health conversation. Um, and I think we've gotten to a place maybe on the f kind of on, in our financial lives where we've we've become OK with saying, hey, you know, I need to keep a budget for the month, right? Mm -hmm. There are times that I can go out and to, to a great restaurant. You know, yeah. I was talking to, to Dr. Obedia about this the other day. Um, you can go out to a restaurant and have a great steak, yep. you know, and it's a hundred bucks or whatever. Yep. Um, and that's okay once in a while, uh -huh. you know, and with your health, like we get very dogmatic oftentimes, especially Way around nutrition. <laughs> yep. It almost becomes religious. It's it's harder than a political conversation. Nowadays. It really is. Yeah. It really is. And so I was like, I feel like it's fine. Man, that's that is a um I don't drink anymore either, except with my wife on vacation, because there's yeah. nothing better to me than having a drink with my wife by the pool yeah. looking over the ocean. Like it's a soulful experience. Yep. And I think my kids are going to remember on Friday nights that, you know, we had pizza together. Like, yeah. I remember that from my childhood. That exactly. Every Saturday night we had pizza, yep. you know, and it's just like a, a a soulful thing for us. And so I think we have to make sure that we have a bit of a um, – there's a tension here a little bit between eating healthy but also yep. doing things that just bring us we, joy. We need to reframe the conversation because right. the, the mass population way overdoes – all of that stuff. And then the N1 population way under does it. Like they get too extreme and dogmatic about it. And then they yell in your face, like, yeah. oh, you're going to get knocked out of ketosis. And it's the worst thing in the world. Like the, I think the happy ground is, is, and this is, I'm very biased towards this as well, because I have a book coming out on this, <laughs> is that we need to think about this as our energy bucket. Mm -hmm. And our energy bucket has all of the different factors that make us human and make us happy and mm -hmm. make us joyful and pleasurable to be around. So it includes mindset. It includes our environment. It includes our family. It includes our social interactions. And when we, when we sacrifice the rest of our bucket to, for the sake of a diet, that's when things start to become really unhealthy. Sure. So this is the extreme happens, you know, it's very common, uh, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, dairy-free, like soy-free, these fractions of diets, they tend to get too extreme 
and we tend to see worse health outcomes at the mm. end of the day. So in other words, for a short while, they get really healthy and the human brain wants to celebrate that when in reality, it's not the diet, it's their cortisol and other things, sure. and factors that are kicking in, making them healthier and making them feel better. And there's nothing wrong with that. But long-term sustainability, we need to think about our energy bucket. Mm -hmm. And this energy bucket is the concept that when the bucket is full, we're super happy, we are joyful, we we play around, we, we feel like we're in flow and momentum. Yeah. When the energy bucket's empty, it's hard to wake up in the morning, it feels like life is a struggle, everyone's against us, we get angry really quick, those sorts of things. And to fill that bucket, we need pizza with our kids, if that's meaningful to you, right? Sure. Everyone yeah, yeah. has their own definition. Yeah, of, yeah. And that's why I describe it as a bucket, because everyone's bucket is different. Um, you know, some of us like art, some of us hate art, you know, the list goes on, of course. Um, but we need to find out what fills that bucket for us. And so if we try out a diet, we have to keep in mind that, yeah, we can have success with it. Uh, but the long term is we need to find the happy balance. So things like the keto, the keto diet, great, helps a ton of people. And it's an amazing thing to do. Carnivore diet, same thing. But these things are all meant to have cycles. They're not meant to be permanent things. Even a classic diet that would be healthy, like let's just say you're eating a vast majority of, there's no preservatives in your food, you're eating all meat, root vegetables, you know, you're eating your salads, all of those sorts of things. Like we fall into habits and those habits actually become destructive for us. Uh, and I first learned this a lesson the hard way when I was doing IgG testing uh, which is uh, in, inflammatory testing, mm. food sensitivity testing mm -hmm. in my office when that stuff first started coming out. Uh, and I had this personal trainer who was just ripped. She was like crazy in shape, crazy healthy. She was eating nothing but salmon, broccoli, and yogurt to get that way, right? Wow. And she developed like massive inflammatory arthritis. She got to the point where suddenly it was like in a one-month period – she, her joints became so swollen that she couldn't move. She was bedridden. Uh, and it was because she became so sensitive to that food. And so the, the wow. take home message with all of this is that our lives require diversity. And what works for us now is not going to work for us six months down the road. But the human brain wants to develop habits and do the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again. And the reality is we constantly have to put our body into adversity with changing programs, changing the way we do things, all of those sorts of things. And if we have that awareness and we cycle through things, we're much happier and healthier. Yeah. I love that. Well, you know, um, when you walked up here and we started chatting, you had just come from the Sapien Center. So we're, yes. we're here and shout out to the Sapien Center. <laughs> we're going to shout out to the Sapien Center. If you're in Austin, Texas, the Sapien Center is just a super cool place. Yes. Very it's cool. got what a weight room. It's got uh, yeah, sauna, it's got a barrel it's got sauna, cold plunges, plunge, and it's yeah. a membership based community yeah. co working. It's super, it's super cool. Yeah. Super cool. Um, but the reason I bring it up because the, the last couple of topics I want to talk to you about are the ones not on our bodies, but what we do with them, um, with saunas and cold <laughs> yes. plunges yes. being kind of a, a newer, I mean, not totally new, but a, 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 a newer thing on, on YouTube. I bet it's, you the, it's the fad thing right it, now. We'll put it that it, way. Okay. Yeah. If you want to say it, you said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so you t tell us about like, what is, is, is there science behind this? Or oh, massive amounts of science. Okay, and, so let's start yeah. sauna first because I want to talk to you about cold plunge. You and yep. I are going to have a little conversation here about cold Sweet. plunge. You're going to help yep. me through it. Exactly. Uh, but sauna first, what what, what is the, the, the science behind saunas? Yeah, so I say this because uh, I say it's a fad because just about everything that's good for humans uh, has been done for centuries. And so the, the time-tested things uh, keep coming back in cycles. So uh, we can look back and, and we can look at marketing and things like that. And that's why I say it's a fad is suddenly, you know, Instagram and TikTok got into cold plunges when, mm -hmm. you know, like in my office, I, I had cold plunges in my office 20 years ago kind of thing. Well, right? athletes like, do cold plunges yeah, after it, athletes games. Athletes are early adopters time, right? to yeah. things. And what was funny is when I first started my, my practice 2007, uh, I quickly became uh, – uh, involved with many CrossFit gyms because they were just getting started. Mm -hmm. There was there was ten different boxes in Madison, and uh, it was like pulling teeth to get them into a cold bath. 
like no one had heard about it yet. And uh, I would just go out and buy 200 gallon horse troughs and dump ice in it. And I'd bring it to the, the box and I'd like teach them about cold therapy and things of that nature. Cause it wasn't a fad yet. Yeah, sure. But I kept saying, Hey, you know, people have been doing this for centuries to fight off colds and blah, blah, blah. And the research was just starting to come out. Now it's super science-based. And so everything ancient is now being proven through science, which is really awesome. Yeah. I love it. Uh, I geek out over it. Uh, but saunas and, you know, think of the sweat lodge from the Native Americans, right? Throughout history, we have always had these methods to make people sweat. Sweat is the natural detoxifier for our bodies, just at the basic, simple level. Uh, so lots of cultures go into uh, our feet, our feet excrete a lot of toxins. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of cultures will go through like different oils, different, you know, hot socks, cold socks, things of that nature that have been used for centuries. Um, so the sauna is great. And there's biblical references to that too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so hopping into a sauna, the biggest thing with both cold plunge and sauna is that it's an adaption just like working out. And most people live at 72 degrees now with all of our current sure it's a huge problem that we don't get any of this metabolic like heat flexibility in our bodies and it makes us not sweat and so we hold on to all this toxicity uh we don't get the proteins like the heat shock proteins and the cold shock proteins that are supposed to be formed there to help us figure out how to get rid of our fat so we have different types of fat in our body and this is part of the difference between a cold shower and a cold bath is we can stimulate different hormone production and things like that with these different types of therapies. Mm -hmm. uh, so very powerful now that we know the science behind it, but get into the sauna, get into the cold plunge, get into the cold shower at small increments at first. And we have to train just like we're lifting or running. We got to work our way into these things. Yeah. So with the sauna, like hit five minutes and it doesn't matter what kind of sauna it is, infrared or barrel sauna, heat sauna, you know, just get in there and start to experience it. Infrared has benefits that the, the heat sauna doesn't have, and the heat sauna has benefits the infrared doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So there's no wrong way to do it. And and lots of people in today's uh, influencer marketing, you know, the, the that dogmatic approach to it, oh, you can only do this. No, just you know, that consistency goes sure. back to that. Get in there. And then work your way up over the course of three months. So. Mm -hmm. Put down a calendar and be like, okay, at the end of three months, I want to achieve 20 minutes and just work your way back. This week, I need to do five minutes. This week, I need to do 10 minutes. This week, I need to do 15. And you work your way towards something. Yeah. And so uh, on the sticking on the sauna side again, what, what are the health benefits of the sauna? I mean, is there scientific studies that say if you do saunas, yeah. heart attacks go down or... Yeah, cardiovascular risk improves your... Okay. your, your Metabolic flexibility is is the best term for okay. it. So your ability to handle different situations, you're producing chemicals that make you more anti-fragile. It's a great book by Nassim Taleb, uh, Anti-Fragile, um, which is the concept that we need these stressors applied to our bodies in order for our bodies to adapt in a positive way. Mm. That's what the heat will do for us. Okay. The heat makes these proteins start to form in our cardiovascular system. It makes the blood vessels work and become more flexible. Uh, and so we have less blood pressure issues. We have less, you know, overall issues of cardiovascular risk by just getting into the sauna. Amazing. <laughs> yep. I'm assuming for the cold plunge, similar. Very similar. Creates yeah. metabolic. Metabolic you, flexibility. flexibility. Yep, okay. exactly. And so by getting into that cold environment, and uh, there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, thankfully, we even have some good research on this where they've done in the military now that you can take a cold shower uh, in 30 seconds, uh, five times a week is really all that it takes. Uh, the goal is to get uncomfortable with the cold shower. Mm -hmm. And the way I like to describe it is the front part of your body right below your throat. Uh, this helps with things like thyroid hormones and, mm -hmm. and just different me metabolic flexibility that way. If you're trying to achieve fat loss by doing cold, and then they, uh, I'll get into this in a second, but you can increase fat loss by putting the cold shower on the back of your neck. There's a little brown fat uh, sensory area there mm. that when we put cold onto that, we can actually start to stimulate our body to burn more fat. Um, so those two areas are key when we're doing the cold shower. You're just doing it where I tell people, 
um, because you've never had this blood pressure response, be sure to put your hands up on the wall and then <laughs> you, you work on towards, uh, uh, working towards getting colder and colder. So you start at a medium temperature for what you consider medium temperature and you work on getting it colder and colder until you start to feel that gasping of air uh -huh. that <gasps> kind of sensation. And that's where you've achieved your max for that time. And then over time that gets colder and colder that you can achieve right. until you reach max cold for your shower. Yeah. Um, so that's the best way that I've seen cold showers that will start to prepare you for cold submersion. Cold submersion is much different than just going out into the cold air. Cold submersion is you're getting typically in a 56 degree, 58 degree or colder, uh, submersion, a bath, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, if you're old school and you don't have a fancy little gauge to monitor that, it's just dumping two bags of ice into your bathtub. <laughs> um, and Very whatever scientific. that temperature is. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you work your way into it. So like the first couple of times you do it, uh, you only go up to your chest uh, and then you work towards submerging up to your neck. And even for me, like I'm at the point where I get massive benefits if I dunk my head in there too. So I plug my nose and I I dunk in and mm -hmm. that's only for a few seconds of holding my breath, of course. Um, so I will say there's two things. So now we're getting into, cause I know you want me to, to yeah, no, I, help and you I, with I the cold version. Yep. Because man, I am the biggest wuss when yep. it comes to cold water. Yep. And you know, I, I was at, we just got a little place out on the lake, but there's a, a, a swimming pool out there. I think it was 70 degrees and I got in, I'm like, Oh my gosh, and this is 70. <laughs> yeah. This, yep. you know, and I know these cold plunges, you said it's in the fifties. I've you know seen guys that have it in the forties, right. And yep. maybe even the thirties in some, some cases, I mean, what but there's a difference between recreational cold and intent cold. Yeah. And so like when we're getting into an ice bath, we, we have an intent about us when we're going into a swimming pool and it's just a little colder than we we're expecting. Yeah. That can actually be torturous yeah. sometimes. Like, so I, I need you to hold me accountable here. So yeah. this is the deal. So, you know, right after this, this, uh, this talk, we're going to, you're going to, I'm going to go through yep. a little bit of training. You're going to yep. tell me what to do here right now. Well, and gonna, I'll go yeah, do I'm it. I'm going to start training now. Cause I think it's really important for the viewers. Okay. There, there's two classifications. There's the first time that you've ever tried to do something like this. I'm a cold plunge virgin. Yep. It and is. then there's every time after that. Okay. And, and so typically when you hear your Instagram influencers and people like that, trying to talk about how to do cold, they're referring to people who have already tried it once and are getting into it. So they're talking about breathing and things like sure. that. The biggest thing that I found after so many years of teaching people how to do this is that uh, we have generational fear of cold water and mm. we have to just go experience it to realize that cold water is not going to kill us. And so there's no amount of prep work. It's actually uh, less coaching and more just shoving you into the water for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to give me a very formulaic way yeah, for me yeah. to, to well, do this. That's after. So that's optimization of getting okay. into cold water. All right. There's a formula. The first time is is we have all we these... have Jose here with us who's yeah, who's our into... producing our pod and I think Jose <laughs> is going to come with me for the Heck yeah uh, man the, at the yeah, okay. if, we're, he's if we're going to do it at he's the in. Sapien Center there's two okay. baths at the same there time you we can have you both well, I thought about it but I'm checking out just like Andy. <laughs> he's checking out he's checking out so so the first time like we have this crazy yeah. obsession the the past eighty years we've had this hypothermia conversation where. Our, our moms have told us that if you go outside in the rain, you're going to get sick. And if you fall into frozen water, you're going to die of hypothermia. And we have this ingrained and subconscious fear that you can't get over until you experience cold. So no amount of breath work is going to overcome that fear. It's the mental preparation of overcoming the fear for the first time. That is the biggest challenge. And so I'm like hyperventilating and thinking about exactly, it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because our subconscious is trained that we're going to die. Yeah. And we have to overcome that. And so the best thing that I've found to do that is to just to understand like there's tens of millions of people that have done cold water submersion and lived and it's okay. Your body is going to adapt and we're not going to try to set a timer. We're not going to try to like set a record going into the water, right? We're simply going to try to get in. And the whole objective for the very first time is to feel it, understand that you're in it, be present with it, and to try to control your breath. Okay. So at first, you're just going to gasp for air and everything's going to go crazy. Your mind is going to start racing. And you're going to be like, what the 
did I do? <laughs> like all those kind of crazy thought process. And, and as soon as you start to center it in, you got to focus on a point and it doesn't matter what it is. You focus on a point far away or close. You try to envision controlling your breath and that controlling of the breath. When you start to, <sighs> mm -hmm. when that happens, your body will start to get warm. It's a really cool feeling. Man. And and so as soon as you get out of the chaos of your own brain, your body will auto-regulate to open up those blood vessels the way they need to, to turn on the furnace within your body. And it's that's what you're trying to achieve on the first one. And when you hit that, then all of the other cold sessions after that, that's where you're optimizing. That's where we can try to tell you to envision a fireball in your chest and you can do different meditations and you can do Wim Hof methods. And, you know, there's a million different breathing techniques and things like that to get you prepared. Mm -hmm. Basically the whole goal is to turn your furnace on while you're going into the water, control your breath work and you become insanely present. It's like you're an elite level athlete or an elite level military person, like Tom Cruise flying his jet into an intense situation. And if you get that mindset about it, cold therapy becomes extremely therapeutic that way. Okay. You get totally that that presence about Are you. Are we bought in, Jose? You can, you okay, can solve first. world problems Says. after it. It's really crazy. Okay, well, like, I, I, I'm saying it here publicly because I need to be held <laughs> right? accountable. Yeah, we got you. I need to be held accountable. <laughs> we got I need you. to go and do it. Um, and so we're going to do it. Yeah, um, I'm excited. Good. Man, I, I'm I want to have you back because I know you're, you're writing a book. Yes, and I would love to have you back when that's ready to yeah. to roll because I'd like to talk more about it. Yep, because we could probably talk for another two hours right now. Oh, totally. um, yeah, it's it's because it's how I'm actually training my AI. So it's a, okay. It's the construct of the the six categories of that go into your bucket mm -hmm. are what I'm training an AI on of like how to actually fill your bucket with all of this digital health data. Because that'll be a meaningful way. And so there'll be lots to talk about. Man, I love that. Yeah. Dr. Dave is fun. Looking forward to seeing you over this. I'm not looking forward to seeing you at the Sapien yeah, right? Center to go do my cold plunge, but we will do that. We will uh we'll put it on this pod so you actually see yep. it, see it happen. We'll um, band together, we'll do it. Jose is looking at me like I'm a crazy man, but we're gonna yeah. we're gonna do that. And we'll have videographic evidence. There you go. <laughs> Dr. Dave, thanks, brother. Thank Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, like we said, when we were podcasting in the studio, yeah, uh, the first time that we're just going to kind of push you in, we want to overcome that fear, that uh, anxiety that everyone has. So the first time is slightly different than all the other times. Okay. The first time, all that we're trying to do is concentrate on getting our breath. Okay. When we go in, we're just going to gasp for air like that. And the whole goal is to just slow our nervous system down and get to the point where we feel like we can breathe normally. And then that's all we're going to do for today. Okay. For the first time. So how long do I have to stay in there for? When you catch your breath. Okay. Yeah. All and right. So we're going to go up to here. You're going to try to work your way in. You're going to catch your breath. And then we'll have you come out. Okay. And then you'll put your hands on the side there to make sure. So go like this, just as your blood pressure comes back. The first time doing this, we don't know how your blood pressure responds. So you just safety. So you don't see like all over, yeah, because your blood pressure is going to go okay. and your heart rate's going to change drastically. My heart is beating like 100 miles a minute. Exactly. And that's why, so it's the fear of the unknown. And that's why our heart starts to get really amplified. And this is actually one of the biggest benefits of doing this in the first part of it is simply just overcoming the aspect to get in. Okay. Just like going to the gym, the biggest aspect is getting your shoes on to go to the gym, not actually being at the gym. So the biggest aspect of this is just simply getting in. Once you start to get good at this and you can make it a routine, then you start talking about length of time, how many times a week, controlling breath, all of that kind of fun stuff. So, yeah. all, right, all right, here we go. Just go. So mentally focus, just get present, think about the water, think about controlling your blood pressure, think about controlling your heart rate, and then slowly start to get in. And as you go in, just start to focus on your breath. Yeah. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> I don't like this. This is why we push people the first time. <laughs> there you go. Focus on you. Focus on the water. Breathe, breathe, breathe. There you go. You got this. Work on slowing down your breath. There you go. Bigger breaths. 
big and long exhales. There you go. See how your body's starting to regulate? Just feel that slowing down. There you go. It's cold. Cold, but not bad. Not the end of the world. That's what we like. We survived this, I, try, I promise. <laughs> This is starting to get to the good point right now. This is where the body starts to change. You can see the red flushing is starting to go away. You can see he's starting to control his breathing a lot better. There you go. And if you want to, you're good. You can come out. Or if you want to challenge yourself, you can stay in. Okay. You good? All yeah. right. So remember just to hold on to the sides. Get up nice and slow. And then the biggest benefit of this comes from after. So we don't dry off right away. We actually just try to let our body temperature come back up. <laughs> <laughs> that was cold. That was cold. That was cold. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. You've got your good line. Yeah. Good red line. <laughs> All right. I did it. So how long do I have to stay like this before I can <laughs> Until you start to feel like you're warm enough. Okay. And then that's where the benefit comes in. Just like working out, it's not so much the actual workout, it's the recovery from it. So the recovery from the cold is where a lot of our chemical benefits come from this. It's fine. It's my fingers, my toes, where it really yep. hurts. Yep. And so they're not acclimated to feeling that and understanding what it means. Once you get used to cold bath, that starts to go away a little. Or you can buy little babies, their little neoprene sleeves that go over that. What are I made like 30 seconds? No, you might have like a whole minute for that. All right. Yeah, I feel you good about it. I did good for you for sure. Perfect.